Thank you for joining for this episode of the Techspective podcast. Uh, my guest for this episode is my good friend, Mr. Uh, Richard Steenan. So, Richard, if you could, uh, I mean, you've been on before, people, you've been yeah. around, people know you, but go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Hey, Tony, I'm Richard Steenan. I'm a uh, industry analyst and I cover the entire cybersecurity space, which I now count 2,891 vendors making that space up. That's a lot. That's a very lot. But, and, you know, you know, you and I have been, you know, friends and professional colleagues for many, many, many years. Um, I want to say, I think it was 2012 that we did the the Cancun thing with Kaspersky. Yeah. Um, that sounds, sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I was jealous because you got in. You got in a day early and went and did the a snorkeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, a blast. Yeah. That was yeah, really I, cool. I, I, I didn't. I didn't get to do the snorkeling, but we did like a a cave, uh, like kind of a spelunking thing. That, that was, was cool. amazing. That's still one of my top excursions ever. Hang on one second. Dogs always want to be part of the show. So oh, of course, of I have course. To take away their toys so they sit down and shut up. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, swimming in a cave that was awesome. Yeah, I mean it was it was a good time, and uh, we also did the uh, uh, they had that like dinner where, and then there was like the the uh, Aztec dancers. Yep. 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 Um, it was a good time. Like. Uh, yep. the, the, and it's been, it's been many years since I've gone to the, uh, uh, you know, security analyst summit. Um, I think the last time that I was even like considering it was the year they went to like the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. like six years ago, I think seven maybe. But uh, and then I remember like everyone got food poisoning or a lot of people got food Ooh. poisoning. And I was like, oh, I'm glad I didn't go. Yeah, there. It, by the time they asked me to attend the one in, um, I think it was going to be in Tenerife in the Canary Islands, which is quite a draw. Um, but by then, the news had come out that Kaspersky used to um, salt virus total with fake stuff in order to get their competitors to identify, you know, things that they shouldn't be identifying as, as viruses. And I said, that's just underhanded, not not good citizens. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that, uh, you know, I mean, you, like I said, you, you, you've you been an analyst for a long time. You've been, you know, you've been a Gartner. You've been doing IT Harvest for, for, for many years. You've, you've done a variety of things. That, you know, when I was at Cyber Reason, uh, we worked with you on the project you guys are doing with the, uh, you know, the different demo days. Uh, yep. You know, we did the XDR demo days. Um, so you're, you're, you're a busy guy. Um, but in between there, you, you, you know, a few years back, you did the, the security yearbook, which yeah. uh, I've got my, I've got my autographed Ooh. 2022 copy, cool. um, right here. I see you've got like a stack of them on the shelf behind you. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in boxes and, all around me in a warehouse with, I don't know, six pallets in it. <laughs> well, so I'm curious, like, you know, like when, yeah, I thought it was a, it was a, an ambitious undertaking when you did the first one. I mean, that's it. You 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 did a lot of research, um, and you know, and there's a lot of information in the book. I I appreciate. I really like the the way the book is laid out because it's kind of like it's it, it ends up being sort of two things. Like it is it is a it is a book. Like you know, because you did 2020, 2021, 2022. So like, you know, it you you have chapters in there of you know, different profiles of, of people or companies or or concepts in cybersecurity. And you talk about, you know, kind of like some 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 trending things. But then you get to like the the last two thirds and, you know, it's more of a database, uh, you know, an encyclopedia of of, you know, things. Um, yeah. you know, and then that's so it goes it goes from sort of. Uh, not really narrative, but it goes from, you know, an in informational book to a reference book kind of right. kind of thing right. um, with a ton of, again, information like, you know, uh, the, uh, you know I, I don't I already don't remember the number you just 
spouted about the <laughs> number of cybersecurity vendors, but there's a lot of vendors in this book. Um, so uh, I guess my, my, my first question on that is when you did the 2021, when you did the first one, I mean, I guess, you know, the fact that it said, you know, security yearbook 2020 sort of implied future years, yep. but did you have the vision for like, okay, this, I'm going to, I'm going to come back. I'm going to keep updating this. Uh, I absolutely did because the data changes so quickly and I've been tracking, you know, I've had a list of all the vendors since 2006 and, you know, I try and figure out how to publicize it without giving away the, you know, 2000 hours it takes to actually create that list, right? Do all the research and grab, you know, go to every single conference site and grab all the exhibitors and just keep building on it and check the status of companies that you thought you knew, but got acquired or they failed and shut their doors. Um, so I knew that the list would change every single year. And sure enough, in 2022, um, since 2022 came out, we've eliminated 200 vendors that have disappeared, right? They go under. Um, we've added 300 so far this year. We'll probably add 500 in total for next year's edition. And every year about 400, no, well, somewhere in the 200 to 400 range get acquired. And sometimes they get acquired and disappear. Um, but sometimes they get acquired and they stick around, right? A private equity company acquires them and the, the brand is still there and, you know, like uh, tenable, right? They got acquired, but it doesn't mean they disappear. They, you know, eventually went public. Right. But other smaller companies might be kept as separate brands within the big holding company. Like a lot of the companies that got acquired by VMware, um, you know, so carbon black was still carbon black. So I would track it, I would just indicate that it was a VMware subsidiary, I guess. Yeah, well, and this is sort of peripheral to that conversation, but um, I always find it interesting when a company acquires a, a known entity yeah. and then rebrands it. And the one that stands yeah. out in my head is Open DNS. No, the one that stands nope. out in my head is AT and T acquiring Alien Vault. Yeah, no, it's because I'm like Alien Vault security. was already yeah. like this iconic, like you, you you couldn't go to an event without seeing Alien Vault. Like it was everywhere. Like it, it was a very well known brand. Yeah, and yep. they and they were so, I'm gonna say egotistical <laughs> about their about the AT and T brand that they're like, I oh, would just call it AT and T security. I'm like, well, yeah, but nobody wants AT and T security. Like they, right. they want Alien right. Vault. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, it's like, am I going to buy Verizon security? I mean, they've got a bunch of stuff too. And yeah. So, I mean, I thought that was, I thought that was a, a, an interesting decision. It's not the decision I would have made. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I see more and actually maybe this has changed some, like, I feel like when Blackberry acquired silence that they've maintained silence, but more and more, I, I feel like. I'm seeing that name less. And yeah, yeah, and it barely, barely comes up, even though Blackberry's, you know, super active. They're doing something with it. Just can't tell what, because as you know, when a company gets acquired, the first people on the chopping block are the marketing and, and promoting teams, right? They don't need those guys. They've already got their own, um, which is an unfortunate thing about our business. True. I mean, I mean, it. Yeah, I would say it's not even, not even just them. But I mean, yeah, that's just one of the one of the casualties yeah. of of M and A is. That's right. At some point, you go, okay, well, I don't need two accounting departments. I don't need two marketing departments. Like some of you got to go. Like, I mean, you need more people because you've got a larger company. But uh, that's why yeah. I always tell people, you know, especially at the CMO level, get that change of ownership clause in where you immediately vest if your company gets acquired because you don't want to join i mean you, you really want to join a company six months before it gets acquired but not if that means you're barely vested right so you got to get that because the, the, that because turnover the, the standard model at least the standard model for you know my level the standard model that i've been you know offered is yep. you know hey we're going to give you this equity um but 
one fourth of it will vest at your one year anniversary. And then the right. other three fourths will vest over the next three years after that. So it takes yep. you four years to hit that mark. Right. Right. That 12 month cliff. And sometimes, sometimes every, they're really nice, right? They, the acquirer wants you to stick around. So they'll continue that vesting schedule. And if it's a public company, the vesting really means something now uh, because you get, you can buy that stock every quarter. Right. Um, well, you know, I, I had mentioned to you that one of the one of the things that, you know, I thought was, you know, kind of stood out to me most. I mean, maybe not most, but one of the things that stood out to me for sure in this. Uh, the latest. Uh, security yearbook is the, the chapter on funding routes. So yeah. 2021 was a huge year uh, for cybersecurity funding. Um, you know, I mean, you, you should look at the the notable one being at the top of the list with Lacework taking in, you know, one point eight, you know, over one point eight billion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In funding. Um, but what was the total? The total was uh, twenty six. Yeah, twenty six billion. Twenty six. And that includes some of the weird financial things that went on at at uh, Splunk, for instance, which was issuing pipes for over a billion dollars. Um, but, you know. That's real funding, right? They sold additional stock to particular investors at the market rate or a little below. Um, that 26 billion is more than twice the previous record of 10 billion. And the interesting thing is I, I'm tracking all the data now. So, you know, every year it's got to get easier to produce the book at, in January because I have to wait till the end of the year to have all the data. Um, but right now, we're, the industry is tracking at twenty-four billion dollars. So, uh, you know, we're going to be in really good shape, right? It's you know, even though everybody's talking about down rounds and conserving cash and layoffs at companies like Cyber Reason, which is what well, I was going to say, which is what I wanted to, to, to talk about. And you know, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw Cyber Reason under the bus. They're certainly no. not alone. No, no, no. no. Um, you know, many companies across the industry, you know, and Lacework being one of them. So I yep. mean, Lacework had literally just taken like, you know, a billion dollars in funding six months previously and then let like a thousand plus people go or something, you yeah. know? Yeah, and, you know, the for a mature company, right? So General Electric is famous for this. It's common to have a policy of axing the bottom 10% performers every year. Super cruel policy, mind you. Um, but, you know, that way you know you've got, you know, good performers, whatever that is uh, in your organization. And even at Gartner, I remember being there and they started stack ranking uh, the employees and starting to do that. So that one method, but obviously in a high tech startup of any caliber, um, you know, it's all about growth. You don't have time to make those decisions. The people you hired six months ago were probably 50 percent of your company because you're growing at that rate. Um, so you can't, you know, deem them non-performing and let them go, right? Because it takes six months to a year to get people to ramp up to performance levels. Um, but companies like Lacework that were super heavily invested in, and it felt like, you know, good old market share grab, the economy's hot, investment and money is easy. Uh, let's just hire, hire, hire. Like I call it, you know, pre-hiring, right? Before the demand or the need for them is there. And it takes an engine to hire that many people, right? You've got to have processes in place. Some companies are hiring 100 people a month. And how do you even do that, right? Because we've all been through the the, the new uh, interview process, right? It means six Zoom calls, you know? And how do you do that with 100 people? And the 600 people you probably do it with in order to winnow it down to 100 people. So you have to build that huge team and in that process in order to do it. So that's part of where all that investment money goes is building that growth engine internally. Um, so they've got that and it's kind of difficult when you have to, you know, twist the dials to slow well, it down. Yeah, and you know, I'm admittedly, uh, you know, I was gonna say, I was gonna say naive, but 
ignorant <laughs> of, of the, the, the kind of inner workings of like how those how those decisions are made in terms of like. Uh, you know, when it's, they're looking at when like when they're looking at IPO, like I've been at multiple companies that n now and, you know, going from tenable to alert logic to cyber reason that were, you know, allegedly on the verge of or or marching toward IPO like that was that's the goal. And right. and I mean, like lots of companies are, but I mean. Alert logic and cyber reason both, you know, were specifically like in the conversation, like like sure. it was like, it was like a well, any day now they're going to announce. Right. Um, and, you know, but then somebody, you know, somebody somewhere, the, the, the VCs and the CFO are, are sitting in a room, you know, looking at tea leaves and, and, and trying to determine like, okay, when, when's the right time to pull the trigger? And then, you know, if you, it's, it's a, it's, a, I want to say sort of a half, half dark art and, and half pure luck. But, you know, when, when you, when you miss that moment. Uh, yeah. And you don't pull the trigger, and then you go, okay, well now the market changed. Never mind. We're, you know, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I've been in those rooms, and it's not pretty. You know, it's, um, it is, you know, yeah. There's a lot of numbers behind it and all the rest, but quite often it's just somebody's gut feel or based on their experience back in 1999, and you know, and just no really solid picture of where the company's at. The Best situation is when the CEO founder still owns majority of the company and they have a vision. And so, you know, you watch Z's killer, right? There was, uh, Wall Street was, they had all these rumors that Cisco was gonna buy Z's killer. And if you knew Jay Chandra, you knew that would never happen. And he would not even engage in those conversations. Just he's already sold four or five companies. He's been there, done that, and he's done with it. This is his baby that he's been working on since 2008. Well, so right, so so, so I'm so I, I I don't know how they make those decisions, but you know, to 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 the point uh, you were making prior to that, you know, cyber reason in particular. Mm -hmm like doubled in size i mean la last year 2021 was it was an aggressive growth year in terms of the size of the company and we were hiring like insanely you know like they were just hiring like it, it was hard to keep track of like <laughs> the teams and who you were working with because it was like they were just new oh, people all the time i bet yeah um and you know and we we got a good chunk of money last last year uh you know with the the series f funding round it was you know 300 325 million you know flowing in and you know so me sitting in my you know at, at my desk doing my job i mean i'm thinking hey we're, we're in a really good spot here you know we've got you know um, you know tons of money flowing in the company's growing like crazy uh, you know, we, we had all these like, you know, successful milestones and then, you know, one day they're like, yeah, you know what, we're, we're, we're pulling back. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, cyber reason grew 87% in headcount last year to 995 people, which is that to me, you know, just a rule of thumb is when a company hits a thousand, they're ready to file to go public a thousand people. That's where Fortinet was. That's where Zscaler was. Um, you know, it just it means that they're succeeding. They're getting they've got product market fit. They are uh, probably have already expanded to all the regions as Cyber Reason has. They're going great. And but obviously, when the market turns down, the market for IPOs vanishes. So you have to wait, right? You got to wait another at least a year. And Cyber Reason has dropped six percent in headcount just in June. So they definitely have cut back um, and are definitely letting people go. But, you know, 6% is they're still at uh, 1200 people. So they're still in that size range that they could go public. Right. Well, and so the other thing that I find interesting uh, about this, the entire thing is, so you have, you have companies like Cyber Reason or Lacework that, that Everything was kind of tracking in the right direction. Money's flowing in. Things are great. And then, and and then it's like, wait, never mind. The market, the market doesn't look great. We're not going to be able to IPO. We're not going to IPO this year. So never mind. Pull back and let's 
you know, conserve cash and and, and extend the runway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. But at the same time, you know, I, I, and 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 again, I should be like taking notes while I'm talking to you, so I can re- recite back the numbers that you you quoted. But you know, <laughs> I think you said we you know we lost something like 200 companies this year, but we've gained like 300. Yep. Yep. Um, so so you know. Things are still happening. Companies are still going, and and then you you know you said we're 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 you know tracking for like 24 billion in investing. So it's like you know to go from 26 billion, which was more than uh, the previous record of 10, but then to follow that with 24 billion or more yep, is yep. you know I, you know the, so so at least you know whether whether or not there's a market for IPOs, there apparently is still very much an appetite from like the VC world. For of, sure funneling money in like that sure. you know it, they they at least seem to have some confidence like okay you know things may be like down this year but it's gonna it's gonna turn around and we're gonna cash in yeah if you think about it a vc's got you know minimum of a five-year horizon on a bet right so they you know if they invest at an a round they might you know they'll get impatient after 10 years and they'll start going maybe we should cut our losses um but it takes five years to get to an exit, be it IPO or sale of a company, which when the VCs make all their money. Um, Very, very rare, by the way, for an investor to be happy with a company that after a certain number of years starts generating cash that they can spit out to the investors, right? That, I don't know of a case of that ever happening. Um, They don't want return on their investment. They want, you know, 10 X on their investment. So, I think um, that I, you know, and I've been looking at growth as well. Um, so, I, you know, growth in the beginning, the first quarter of the year was on pace to match last year's, uh, about 24, 24% overall. Um, you know, and of course, the growth is growth in headcount because that's the data I can get access to. And it, definitely tailed off in the second quarter because VCs were telling people to stop spending money, conserve cash, etc. And yet there are sectors that are still growing at an astounding rate. API security, which only has 24 vendors in it, um, grew 29% in the first six months of 2022. So they, now mind you, there's three that have over 100 million in investment so they can spend that money. They recognize that it's a race to the top um, between no name, salt, sequence. Uh, they got all this money. They got to hire people and get customers as quickly as possible because it's raining API attacks. So they have to fix that that problem. But that means a 60% annual, you know, compound annual growth rate, which is phenomenal. We went back and looked at last year's numbers. Um, you know, pulled out all the API security vendors, and sure enough. They grew 60% last year as well. So you can say it is compounding annually. Interesting. Well, and so, so I, you know, I, I find both, both aspects interesting. One, one being the, just the amount of funding, you know, the, the, the cash, the cash flow in an industry that, you know, at right now is kind of pulled back some, but, um, but then also just the, the spawning of new companies now. So, yeah. you know, I was I was you know part of the uh, you know the cutbacks at Cyber Reason you know like you know like I said one one day everything was great the next day they were like hey you know what you know all all of you people we don't need you anymore right um, you know and, and and you know it's just business it is what it is um, and doesn't I, doesn't feel good though no, you know it's no, like absolutely not all this work um, we did yeah and, and you know and, and and in their defense I don't think it you know I I mean I don't know who who ultimately you know, makes that call. It makes that decision. It says, go, you know, go, go get it done. Find, find me, find me the, you know, the, the, the six percent or the ten percent of the company that we're going to get rid of. But the people who actually like, you know, my manager, my manager's manager, you know, the CMO, like, it, you know, it, what it's not an easy decision for any of them. Like, you know, they're right. they're they're just told, all right, we're we're getting rid of X number of people. I need names. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I don't think it's fun for anyone. But nope. what I found surprising was the 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 target rich environment I I stepped into 
in terms oh, of yeah. new opportunity. So like for sure. When I when I when I left Tenable, when I left Alert Logic, there you know, it, it it was it was hard there for a while to find, okay, well what's you know, what's out here, what's next, you know. Um I I landed uh a, a new gig in under a month. I actually had I had, you know, three actual offers on the table to consider, which I've never I've never been in a position where I was like, all right, well, let me consider these multiple offers, decide which one I want and turn the other two down. Um, and. Not to be cocky, but based on the in in interview cycle, I'm relatively confident that. Uh, had I waited another, you know, week. I would have had three more. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So like I said, I thought, I thought that was interesting. And the thing is, there were, you know, I, I interviewed with known entities, you know, so I, I interviewed with some some of the, the larger names, but um, but I also interviewed with a number of these, you know, co companies I'd never heard of, you know, previously that, you know, that basically as I was looking or as people would reach out to me and say, well, hey, you know, I've got a, you know, I've got a friend over here, they're hiring. Um, yeah, you know, so it it was it definitely a lot of like young startups out there that were mm -hmm. that are in hiring mode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. And and they're I'm not going to say they're desperate, but they you know they they know what they need, and which is really cool to see. Um, so they know exactly who to call on, you know, from their network. Um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm watching uh, phosphorus security closely. Um, cause Chris Ruland, of course, has had five or six startups and I'm watching as he hires in, you know, er, practically every hire I, I either know or I, you know, knew that they were, they used to be with ISS, which was his alma mater. So it's fascinating to watch it just crank up. Um, yeah, well, and. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm I'm, I'm going to go back to the uh, it's not it's not my wheelhouse, so I don't really know how, you know how how those decisions are made or 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 whatever. But um, I, I'm I'm a little curious, like you know, do you think that when when someone starts a company, you know, when 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 you know, you're just out of the blue, you're like, you know what, I see this need, let's 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 start a company. Do founders do they generally go in thinking, you know? You know, we're the, we're the next we're the next Microsoft, we're the next Salesforce. This is going to take off. We're going to be huge. Or do they create companies like, all right, we understand that this is, you know, this is a th this is a market opportunity. Um, it, it's not going to be a dominant market opportunity. Like are, are, basically, I'm like, are there are there are there founders who come into the, you know, the, that launch the startup with the vision of. Being acquired as opposed to the vision of. Going IPO. Um, there are for sure, and as a matter of fact, you know they usually know pretty early on which direction they want to take it, um, because they look at, hey, we we can solve a problem, we've got a great idea, we can build great technology to solve that particular problem, but they usually have, you know, the experience to know that it's going to fit as a feature set in something else. They're just earlier to market because it'll take Cisco forever to even realize they have to develop that. Uh, when they do realize it, they're going to buy us because, you know, we already work with all their Cisco products and we're a good tuck in or a Palo Alto or whoever. So, yeah, occasionally, uh, you know, the founders got, you know, a really big idea, right? I can stop all ransomware magically, you know, at the end point. And they think that's going to take them, you know, all the way to the top. But, but I think they're, they always keep an open mind, you know, because they know, especially right now, they know the IPO market is, can get go into doldrums for extended periods of time. Um, but they think they can create value and get customers. And it, once you're on the startup path, it's just a long slog. And I think that's why investors like to invest in veterans of startups that have been through it before because nobody in their right mind would should do a startup 
if they don't know what it entails because it the amount of work is ridiculous the impact on your family is very unfair to them um you're going to spend a lot more time doing it you're going to have to make a lot more hard decisions it, it's just it's just literally if you knew beforehand you would say it's not worth it i'm not going to work 10 years while my kids go through high school and go to college um just become a billionaire right that's that's not worth it yeah i mean i mean that's very very uh personal and subjective uh determination to make but uh yeah. but but i'd say sitting on the outside it's like yeah you know i mean hey i love money but you know there <laughs> there are some things that it, it, you you can't trade it for um yeah. or you shouldn't in my opinion trade it for right. um, and you you know you the reason most people love money is because it gives them ability if they're entrepreneurs at heart money gives you the ability to do all the cool things you're thinking of all the time so if you had your own money and you didn't have to ask these venture capitalists for it, it'd be great because then you could do the thing you really wanted to do, which is build space rockets. Right. Apparently that's the thing. You know, when you when you when you make it big and you're 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 an Uber billionaire, you you you, you launch a you launch a space company. Yep. Yep. <laughs> which is where I started. It was, I was 12 years old when I decided I wanted to launch a space company. So that was probably before Elon Musk was born. Well, yeah, I I, I don't want to d digress too much into Elon Musk, <laughs> but I feel like he, I I wish he would just focus on the space company and just you know, yeah. <laughs> in the car company, right? They, the car company, be, car uh, company, all right too. Um, yeah. But yeah, like just to like, like stick to stick, stay in your lane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stay out of your friends. No, never mind. Well, yeah, uh, there, 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 there's so many things we could talk about, um, but uh, yeah. So the other thing that I, I that I found interesting, and I and I, you know, so c cyber reason is, um, you know, the founders are Israeli, mm -hmm. and so you know, but uh, and 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 I knew of companies before, you know, Checkpoint. Uh, you know, there are, there are, there are, you know, companies that stood out before that are like, you know, Israeli founded, um, which it, so there's two interesting things there. Number one, the sheer volume of companies and startups yep. that are is Israeli based companies. Yep. Um, the other is the way a lot of them and, you know, cyber reason being one of them establish a u.s headquarters and make that like you know they they almost kind of like they don't obscure the israeli founding or whatever but they they kind of step away from it to try to be an american company i don't know if that right. you know like it's like yeah. oh we're, we're an american company we also have an office in israel as, as opposed to being an, an israeli company right. um and 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 they all seem to all the headquarters seem to be in boston boston is like uh you know the the yeah. the, the tel aviv of of the united states and I, you know, if they even ask, I advise them, you, I'm sorry, you have to headquarter in California and preferably the Bay Area. Um, it's a, you can see the temptation, you've got funding, you can afford the airfare from Tel Aviv to New York or Boston. It's one way, you know, a one hop flight. It's a long flight, you know, six or seven hours. Um, you, you want to just stop there. You don't want to get another six hour flight to get to San Francisco, even though United does have a direct flight now. Um, and that, and I, I picked that up back in the early, way early 2000s. There used to be five uh, Israeli startups that did web application firewalls. All of them were based in New Jersey and New York. They all failed miserably. And then Shlomo Kramer is looking around for his next thing to do, and he said, hey, I like the idea of a web application firewall. He created a headquarters in Silicon Valley, the same way Checkpoint did before they went public. And boom, and Perva went public. So it won this whole thing. And I say it was because of where they headquartered. You know, and it, the temptation is great on the East Coast because that's where all the customers are. That's where all the big banks are. They're going to be the first to buy your product. Uh, but that's, you need a sales office there. 
and the executive staff have to be in the Bay Area because that's where you're going to hire your next CTO, uh, hire your CMO out of out of that existing market. So the Israeli market right now uh, has 232, I think it is, uh, cybersecurity vendors that are headquartered there. The Bay Area has 450. It's twice as big as all of Israel. It's almost bigger in landmass than all of Israel, but not quite. Um, so, that you know, that's the place you just have to be if you want to do this. And, and even YL Ventures, who is a venture capital group that does exactly that, they invest in Israeli companies, immediately require the CEO and the executive team to move and be domiciled in the United States and start working on their green paper green cards and stuff because um, that's a surefire formula checkpoint showed it shlomo kramer showed it checkpoints you know is an anomaly because you know they they kind of faked it right they created a u.s corporation they went public in the u.s they hired a u.s president deb triant um and they tried to make the markets think it's okay they're a u.s company but you know gil evidently doesn't like living in california so he stayed in tel aviv and now they're one of the biggest companies in israel yeah well you know like i said i feel like you know it it, it seems to me based on the, you know, the companies that, that i've worked with and, and spoken to that you know boston has sort of established as the the kind of the the, the silicon valley of the east coast yeah, yeah. oh my god we have austin so you got you got, got boston the is the Boston is the black hole of startups. You go to Boston and you disappear from the public eye. Of all the companies I'm constantly adding to my database, half the time they're in Boston. They're like, all of a sudden, I'll, somebody will connect to me on LinkedIn. I'll go, huh, that sounds like a security company. I check them out. They're three years old. They got 50 employees. They've got funding. And I've never heard of them. And because for some reason, companies in Boston think they're at the center of the universe. They don't have to talk to anybody on the outside. Or maybe my network is just weak in Boston. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I say uh, you've got you've got Barry on the West Coast, you've got Boston on the East Coast, and you've got Austin here in Texas, which has yep. been you know yep. hot spot. Attracting Houston, companies. Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, both. I've got a heat map of all the vendors in the U.S. and Houston and, De and uh, Dallas, Fort Worth are hot areas too. Well, not to again, not to digress this uh, too much, but I feel like given the current sort of political climate and trending and the things that are going on in the United States, um, I personally will judge harshly companies that choose to headquarter in the state of Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Personally, I yeah. feel like companies should refuse to do business in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not just not just don't be headquartered here. Like literally, don't do business with you know. It, like I, I I am all for if 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 I'm Apple or Microsoft, just shut down your stores, pull out your salespeople, and just pretend the state doesn't exist. Um, there you go. You know that that this is because I, I mean again uh, I, I I just feel like. On the one hand, I do I do tend to, I I am more in favor of saying you know what businesses businesses should do business and shouldn't be in politics. I mean if we could if we could if we could erase the Citizens United decision today and get businesses to to just stay out completely, that would be mm -hmm. ideal. But that's not the situation we have, um, and I do feel like well while. There are things that we as citizens can do, you know, voting and, and, and things, you know, politically to be done to try to, like, change, you know, shift the tide and, 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 and get things on track. Businesses can also and they do have stated values, you know, they, they, they you know, if you look at the company values and they say, well, these are the things we value. And it's like, all right, well, put your money where your mouth is then. Um, and and you do see things like where like when when in, in, in past years, when various controversial laws have have been put in place in certain states where companies will be like you know they'll say okay you know what never mind we're not uh, like not even just tech companies but like 
sporting events and stuff and be like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to pull out of that state. We're not going to, you know, we're no longer going to host there. You know, it'd be like if the, if, if Russia was scheduled to host the Olympics, you know, you know, next year or whatever, everyone would go, you know what, let's, let's move that. <laughs> we, yeah. we no longer want to do business with Russia. So uh, when are you going to move back to Detroit? Things well, are fine here. Um, I that that actually is uh, it is on the table. Uh, so like um, you know, I I, I mentioned that my uh, my mother in law passed away uh, earlier this year, um, and so we're actually buying her house. I mean, it was um, we're we're buying her, my wife's brother out of out of the house so that it will right. be our house, um, and so we'll have we'll at least have dual citizenship. Uh, you know, I. I <laughs> It, it, there is a there is an inertia to it where like I've been in Texas like 16 years now. Um, I've hated the state most of those 16 years. And, and again, n nothing against Houston itself or Austin or like you know, specific cities. It's just you know it's the broader yeah, yeah ideology yeah. of Texas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and. And and ultimately, even though I don't have an issue with like Houston itself or 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 whatever or my neighborhood, you know, I, this is all fine. I mean, I, I could do without the hundred plus temperatures, um, but this is all fine. But then in the back of my mind, there's always this thing that says, OK, but no matter what you think of these people or how nice they seem. Fifty one percent of them, at least. Voted for Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz and Donald Trump and, you know, John Cornyn and uh, you know, all these people. I'm like, the people who are in power are in power because a majority put them there. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, and, not your, they're not your people. Right. And and I don't. Yeah. 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 And so so in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like, all right. Yeah, I don't you know, I, 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 I don't agree with the majority of these people. Um, but but the inertia thing is. You know, we came here when my kids were younger, so this is where they grew up. And you know, my you know, I've I've still got a daughter in high school, and you know, she's heavily invested in you know her her you know the the, the things that she's doing. I've got a son going to Texas A and M Galveston, so that there's a lot of things you know kind of that kind of keep us here and, and make it hard to you know harder. I mean, not that we couldn't, but make it more difficult to just decide to leave but my wife has been telling our older kids for years now like okay well you guys need to leave like if yeah. if you leave yeah. the state then we'll follow or we'll at least yep. have an excuse to leave but as long as everyone's in texas then it's like we we sort of feel compelled to stay in texas yeah yeah I, it's funny because here in michigan i'm i'm uprooted from wisconsin to michigan and uh, you know, went to aerospace engineering, so I should have ended up in California or Seattle. Um, but I stayed in automotive, and at my I figured, okay, you know, another eighteen years, and the youngest will have graduated and move out of the state, and I won't have anything keeping me here anymore. Um, but you know, remarried, so now there's six total children, two of whom are settled in Michigan. Uh, but we got the rest, you know. California and DC. So almost there, but you know what? Turns out I like Michigan after all these years. So okay. pretty happy with happy with the taxes, yeah. love in the weather compared for, to for many other years, places. I've said I mean I, I love California. I mean, I, I I I spent a few years in California as a child. Um yep. I have family in California. My best friend lives in California. I, I love California. Um and that's my spirit state. I love the ocean. I love the mountains. Like California's got a lot of things. Michigan doesn't have. <laughs> yep, yep. But, and so for years, my vision has been, eventually I'm going to escape Texas and I'm gonna 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 flee to California. Um. But this year in particular, like uh, I I haven't gotten back to Michigan as as often as I'd like in in recent years. But, um, but I've been back, I don't know, three four times. This year, for you know, various reasons, uh, my son graduated from uh, Oakland University, uh, and what stood out, and you know, my wife and I talked about this, is that's home. Like, yeah. there are lots of places we could move. I mean, I like Denver. I like you know California. I, you know, there's lots of places I like, and I, I'm sure they would be fine. Yeah. But the Detroit area is home. 
Um, and you know, as, as soon as you step off the plane and start driving, you're like, all right, this is it. This, this, yeah. is, where, this is where I belong. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, let, I want to start to wind down, but I wanted to ask, you know, kind of what we're, we're more than halfway through the year. Um, and I think I recall you saying after the 2020 security year book to kind of you know, bring, bring it back that, you know, it, it, it almost became like you're, you're still an analyst, you're still doing other things, but all, but this, this becomes sort of like a full-time gig to, to track it. And I, and I see in, and I don't recall you doing this as much last year, but I see that, you know, you, you frequently now have been doing like posts on LinkedIn, you know, referencing kind of like the live scorecard database type stuff that you're, that you're keeping yeah. track of. Um, yep. I'm, I'm still doing that a lot. The algorithm must not be showing you my stuff. Um, but yeah, it, and and as a matter of fact, it's just been amazing how it's fueling interest. Um, and I, in a sense, I pivoted. I took it to the next level because anybody who sees a directory of 2,800 vendors is going to go, hey, I want a digital copy of that because I'm going to cut and paste it and OCR it and have my own database. So we launched on March 30th, we launched a SaaS application that has all of our data and we're building out the team in order to keep it updated constantly. So it's got every the first day of every month, we update all the headcount numbers. Um, we grab all the new investments, put them in there. Um, we've added collaboration. So a team of people that are seat owners um, could leave notes for each other uh, about particular vendors and we're slicing and dicing it. We're adding events, got the data we're uploading this week for AWS Reinforce. So all the vendors that are presenting or have booths at Reinforce, um, subscribers will be able to sort them based on headcount and growth and you know who's got the most funding and just do all that analysis you can do from publicly known numbers. Uh, we've done that for RSA already. Uh, we're doing it for Black Hat. Um, and then we're adding awards. So we're just constantly adding new data feeds into now the core, which is an engine that can uh, monitor all of this stuff. And it's it's been a blast. Um, and the the goal is that, you know, ha keep the data clean all year. And then on January 1st, push a button and we've got the directory to put in the book. And I just have to write, you know, everything that happened in 2022. Do you, uh, are, are you you keep notes throughout the year of kind of okay that's a that's a yep. trend I might talk about or that's yep. a, that's a story that might be worth it and then and then come January first you kind of have to sit down and go okay well I have this list now right. what are my top ten that's exactly it that's exactly it and then including the histories right so you know, I've written long histories in the book of Semantic and there's so much to learn from it and uh, McAfee. And, you know, and those histories are continuing, right? It's like, I, I don't know if anybody in the world understands where McAfee is right now. You know, what what happened to it? You know, it got acquired like three times in six months. Um, and there's this new thing called Trellix. And what what about the FireEye stuff? Where'd that go? Well, oh, I was well, literally going to say, I was going to say, so <laughs> Mac, McAfee is interesting because of the way it kind of, kind of like, evolved and split and then like you know the, the part of McAfee went this way part of McAfee went that way and now it's Trellix or whatever yeah and, but then the, immediately the other thing that popped into my mind was Mandiant FireEye and it's like you know okay well part of it's over here but part of it's over here <laughs> yeah and where's Verodin who owns that you know it's like not obvious when you poke around it's like the forget that somebody told me but or another one that i still struggle with uh when I, when i'm actually citing them is hp versus hpe i really don't know where the dividing line is and yeah you know, i just i just call it all hp i'm like i i'm never sure like when to use hpe i'm mean, like whatever they're hp it's fine yeah yeah and ibm split in half like last year i i couldn't even tell you the name of the other half all you remember is the ibm part right they gotta rebrand what the other thing is and I don't know where the security team is, and nobody could tell me. You know, yeah, the, the other thing at IBM, it has, it's like a, it's kind of weird name. It starts with a K. Yeah, yeah, it's made or something up. like, and, and and it's like when it when it was first, someone brought it up, and I was like, what is that? And they're like, you know, oh well, it's, you know, it's IBM's like you know, certain you know services or something. And I was like, 
it is like yeah. <laughs> yeah. they forgot they forgot to tell the market that's right yeah and you have to keep telling the market and yeah it's i never see them yeah so that just fodder for the book right and opportunity to criticize the way some of these really big gyrations are orchestrated because they 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 are playing to their audience which might be wall street might be other investors but the market still has to know what's going on well and then it, 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 I, I will i look forward to seeing you know kind of your your insight and i think i feel like the 2023 book will not the one i think it'll take longer but to see how this all plays out with with lace work cyber reason you know all these companies pulling back into austerity mode but again to, to try to see okay well if we go to 2024 and we look back um and we say okay all these companies got all this money they were going to ipo they didn't then they pulled back but we still have all this money flowing into the industry we have all these startups popping up and and then you know so yeah so if i if i go to 2024 and i look back on 2022 and 23 to kind of see okay well how did that all play out you know like uh, how how did how did that work out for lace work how did that work out for cyber reason yeah and you know I, i'd be worried for them especially if i was an investor or advising them you pull back that's the news story your customers are going to go huh you're pulling back whereas this other startup in my backyard is got 50 people uh they took in 100 million uh, i'm going to talk to them about being the provider of whatever security i need so you so if you pull back take your eye off the ball for a second you're going to lose market share because there are a dozen startups going after your existing portfolio the analogy that stands out to me is you know, an NFL football and playing prevent defense when you're, you know, you, you, you know, you've, you've got, you've got the lead, you're going into the final minutes of the, the game. And so you're like, all right, well, we just need to prevent them. You know, we're, we're not trying to win anymore. We just need to right. prevent them from winning. Right. And that almost always fails. Yeah. The prevent defense almost always fails because the cool. other team, the other team is, has motivation. The other team right. is motivated to do something bold to score and win the game. And if, if all you're doing is kind of like, all right, well, we're just going to try to like hold the line, you're at a disadvantage. Yep. And, you know, the lesson learned is don't pay attention to the public markets. You know, pay attention to the real demand that you're experiencing. If all of a sudden every single one of your uh, deals in the pipeline gets extended past the quarter, okay, that's a pretty good sign that things are slowing down and you have to conserve cash. Um, but if that's not happening, double down, get more people on the job, closing those deals. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, I'll, 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 I will look forward to the 2023 uh, security yearbook, but I think it's the 2024 one that I really want. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'll be there assuming I'm here. Um, yep. So I've, you know, minimum, there's going to be 10 additions. So you should start collecting them now, right? Because having a complete collection is going to be so valuable. Yeah. Well, I mean, and mine's autographed. So that's got to be, that's got to be worth something. Yeah. yeah. Um, Definitely. All right. Well, you know, I, 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 I wish you the best. I, you know, I, if I, well, you know, next time I'm up in Michigan, I'll uh, have to let you know, maybe we can get together. But, uh, and, and I really, tr I'm very much looking forward to, live events i really wanted to go to rsa i really wanted to go to black hat um i i had airfare hotel i i was set to go to rsa <laughs> um and like the week before i was like yeah nah i'm i'm, yeah. I'm all right i did um, the same thing so i mean i would love i i would love for things to stabilize and to be able to feel confident going to live events again because you know i i i miss R rsa in particular and like the security bloggers meet up i mean i you know I, I miss my people, um, but uh, I don't miss you that much. <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> All right, good deal. Thanks, All Tony. Right. Take care. I appreciate you investing your time to listen to the podcast, but I also invite you to engage on social media. Uh, please go like our Facebook page and follow at Techspective on Twitter and Instagram. You can feel free to let me know 
what you like, let me know what you don't like, let me know if you love it, let me know if it sucks, and uh, let me know what products you'd like to see reviewed or what uh, questions you'd like to see answered in future posts.